Alright, um, I hope that you guys are all doing well and that you had a good weekend. Um, I just gave you back the clinical immunology assignment. Um, it, it, you know, some people uh, struggled a little bit with that one, um, and in some cases, it was just a matter of kind of not thinking carefully about some of the information. Um, for example, if a patient was missing B cells but not T cells, then a mutation in RAG wouldn't work because you had a mutation in RAG, you'd be missing both. Um, or you could write things like it's a mutation in the V region because the there's many V regions. That's more than one gene. Um, or things like that. Um, the key is up um, on uh, the Moodle site, and all of your grades for the semester are also up to date on Moodle, so you'll be able to find all of that. Uh, remember that the primary lit assignment is due today by 5, um, and remember that you do have the other assignments uh, due on Friday, um, so just be aware of all of that. Um, you got an email from me today with the link to a Doodle poll. Um, for potential review session times for the final exam. Um, so please fill that out before Wednesday's class so that I can announce the review session time on class on Wednesday. Um, and the exam is um, a week from today, um, Monday at 12.30. Um, so that's in the email. It's also on syllabus and like on the website and stuff. Um, but just thought I would remind you. Um, other general questions or things that I should talk about? All right, today is going to be a little bit, I feel a little bit of a hodgepodge mismatch. But I don't know. I don't even know. I keep trying to say this word and I don't even know, can't even say it. Mismatch? Not mismatch, like mishmash. That's the word. <laughs> um, kind of day. Um, because I want to talk a little bit about. Um, some information that I didn't mention with transplantation. Um, I want to talk about a little bit of information about some therapies that are related to um, autoimmunity, um, but they also happen to tie into allergy and transplantation, so it's sort of okay to put them here. And then I'm going to start talking about cancer immunology, though I definitely won't get it finished today. Um, so we're going to see uh, a bunch of different things. and. Um, I told you about some issues that come into play with transplantation. Um, and I just want to mention kind of one other um, issue to be aware of um, that some immunologists are thinking about with transplantation. Um, so here you can see a um, number of patients um, and in the uh, yellow, you see the number of donors who can donate organs every year. In blue, you see the number of transplants that happen every year. And in pink, you see the number of people on the waiting list waiting for organs every year. And so um, what uh, I hope you notice here is that um, as time has gone on, um, we have had a really tremendous need for organs for transplantation. Um, we have a lot of people who um, would like transplants. Um, and right now, we're sort of way under in terms of having enough organs to help all the people who need to be helped. Um, and there are some parts of this that are kind of public policy, public health uh, issues. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them, though I am going to tell you about one on the next slide. Weirdly enough, last night, on John Oliver. <laughs> His entire thing was about issues with organ transplantation. So if you'd like to know about some of the policy issues, I actually learned a lot about some of the kind of really policy sides of this that I was not aware of before this. Um, I, was, I pulled this up because I was going to try to find the clips where he gave the numbers of people on the waiting list and I couldn't find them, but he actually gives the numbers really nicely in there. He explains a lot of issues um, in here really well. So um, if you want much more information than I was planning to give you, um, as I was putting together these slides, this came up and I was like, really? Um, that might be of interest. So like I said, he really talks about a lot of the policy stuff. Um, the one policy thing that I want to 
um, tell you about is this, which is um, a list, uh, it's a table from your textbook talking about um, what percent of people in different countries are um, listed as organ donors. And so you can imagine that one way that you could address the problem of needing to have um, more uh, organs available for all of these uh, people who need organs is to have more organ donors. And you can see that there are some countries where the numbers are, you know, like 99%, and there are some countries where the numbers are like really low. And you can see they're also shown here in two different colors. The two different colors actually are based on the way organ donation is set up legally in the countries. And you can see there's a big difference in percent of organ donors between um, these two sets of countries based on sort of the legality. And the basic idea is um, in the countries that are shown in red, if you do nothing, if you don't tell anybody what your wishes are, they assume you want to be an organ donor. So the only way you cannot be an organ donor is if you say no. In the countries that are in blue, if you do nothing, you're assumed that it's assumed that you don't want to be an organ donor. And so you have to, if you want to be an organ donor, you have to say something. And so in sort of the big difference here is like, what happens if you're lazy um, and don't tell, say anything in the countries in red, then it's assumed that your organs can be donated. In the countries in blue, it's assumed that they cannot. And so you can see that just things like that make a big difference um, in availability. Um, and so that's something that you know we can think about. Um, but there are a lot of other um, issues and a lot of other reasons for this. Um, one thing that I'll just mention here is that one thing that can happen as we have patients who get transplants is that we may get a patient who has a transplant um, and because of things like cyclosporin A and all of our great treatments for patients with transplants, those patients might live for a while. If there's some kind of other, so let's imagine they had kidney failure because of issues with sort of metabolism types of things, and so they're getting kidney damage. If we give them a new kidney, hooray, they can you know, filter blood again. But if we don't actually impact their metabolism, they're gonna destroy that new kidney too. Similarly, if we have a patient who, not that we do this very often, but let's imagine that we had a patient who had type 1 diabetes and who destroyed, whose beta cells in their pancreas got destroyed. And let's imagine we had a way to transplant in new beta cells for them. That's cool, but if we don't do something about the T cells, we're going to need to transplant more beta cells in later on. So some, some of this also comes into the fact that sometimes patients might kind of keep having a need here. So one of the things that people will think about is thinking about things like, can we actually come up with a way to stop the problem higher up so the patient doesn't need a transplant again? But we can also think about things like, can we make a mechanical device to implant in the patient so that we don't have to wait for an organ to be available? Can we grow a new kidney in the lab? Can we figure out how to grow a kidney or whatever organ in tissue culture? There are some ideas of being able to use 3D printers to 3D print certain types of organs. Can we do those types of things to make more organs? Can we use stem cells and inject the stem cells and hope that they will regenerate an organ? You know, can we start to do those types of things? Being able to make any of those things work, of course, requires some understanding of immunology and understanding of kind of what are the immune processes in rejection and how can we get around them to make these things work. One of the other big things um, that people have been thinking about for years, so I first learned about this in 2002, um, and this uh, figure, this picture is from 2002, um, is the idea of whether or not we can get organs from other animals. Um, and use those, and so that would become a potential other source for organs. What we have learned is one of the big issues with thinking about that actually has to do with like the volume of the organ, like the 3D size, which, or which other animals have the organs that are actually the same 3D size as ours. And it turns out that the answer is usually uh, miniature swine. 
These are not the like, little teacup pigs in your purse. These are like big pigs. I was always confused the first time I heard them as miniature swine and then um, that we went to a facility that actually was growing, we had them for transplantation and they are big old pigs. Not any, so don't think very miniature. Um, and so the idea is that a lot of people have thought about can we actually use organs from other organisms like a, a, which would be known as a xenograft. Um, in November 2022, so just about a year ago, the first ever um, pig transplantation um, of organs into humans um, happened and worked. Um, one of the big issues here is that we figured out what some of the most common foreign antigens are, and we've actually genetic made genetically engineered pigs that don't have those antigens to stop rejection. Um, and so, um, again, this is something that a bunch of immunologists spend a lot of time thinking about because if we can kind of use our knowledge to address that big gap in organ transplantation, that could be a really good way to um, help people out. Speaking of ways we use our immunology knowledge, um, I, like, I started to talk a little bit about some of these biologics um, before, and so um, we have a lot of different therapies that we can use for autoimmune diseases um, or for a number of different disease types, um, many of which are types of antibodies. And um, we talked a little bit before about the fact that one problem with using antibodies in therapies is that they may be foreign, like a fully mouse antibody. And so we figured out ways to make the antibodies we use clinically um, closer and closer to human antibodies. First, we figured out just how to make a mouse variable region on the rest of a human antibody. Then we could just do just mouse CDRs. Now we can do it as a fully humanized antibody. But we don't need to have like you know an experimental human colony that makes it. We can do this um, using cells and using animals. Um, and um, any of the drugs that are monoclonal antibodies will have MAB at the end, um, M-A-B, and whether there's OMAB or ZMAB or UMAB or things like that, as you see here at the bottom, will be based on whether it's a mouse antibody, whether it's just um, mouse variable regions, whether it's um, just mouse CDRs, whether it's fully humanized. And so you can see a lot of these types of antibodies. Um, and you can notice here that um, this has been, is something that has been used, you know, for transplantation, for example, um, way back in the 1980s, though this was a fully mouse antibody. Um, we've got some that have been used in, for cancers, which we'll come back to later. We've got some, as time has gone on, that are starting to be used for psoriasis and a number of pretty famous ones that are used for a number of different autoimmune diseases, particularly um, rheumatoid arthritis. And so a lot, we, we use a lot of these different antibodies for these purposes. Now, one of the other therapies that we talked about before was cyclosporin A. And um, I've mentioned to you a few times, cyclosporin A is amazing. It's really revolutionized a lot of um, clinical conditions, but it has this problem of suppressing all the T cells. And so what we're generally trying to do with antibody therapies is we're trying to get a therapy that is a bit more specific. Um, so, it, and we're kind of taking advantage of the specificity of the adaptive immune system. Um, and so you can see one type of um, these antibodies shown here. Um, so here you can see there are, uh, we have antibodies against things like C4 or antibodies against CD20. And this will basically start to deplete CD4 T cells or deplete um, uh, B20 or CD20 positive cells, which are the really activated B cells. So we'll be treating a patient with antibodies with the idea that we are now going to kill whatever that cell is. So now, you know, if we treat with um, an anti-CD4 antibody, this can be very helpful and is used in rheumatoid arthritis. Um, now we're gonna get rid of at least some CD4 T cells. It's not quite as broad as if we got rid of all T cells because now at least the patient still has CD8s. 
and has the other CD4. So it's better. Um, with um, rituximab, which kills um, basically activated uh, B cells um, with CD20, we're going to, again, we're going to get rid of the, acti the already activated B cells. Hopefully, that might include the ones that are making the autoimmune antibody. Um, it's going to include all the other activated B cells, too. But the patient will be able to do more B cell development and kind of make some new B cells. So again, you can see we've gone from like real broad to narrower, but we're still not super narrow. Um, one of the other big therapies that people will use is they will use things like um, CTLA-4, and sometimes we'll even put interesting protein domains on an antibody heavy chain, like it on an IgG1 domain. Um, and so this is basically CTLA-4. Um, so that CTLA-4 molecule, remember, binds to um, CD80, CD86, or B7, 1 and 2, binds more strongly than does CD28. And so T cells can't get activated in this case. So we basically blocked um, some T cells from getting activated here. And you can see that in a number of different autoimmune diseases, if we stop that T cell activation, um, we may help the patient uh, not have so many symptoms. And you can see that happening here as well. So we're actually taking CTLA-4 and putting it onto antibody constant regions. Um, ideally, B7 and CB28 are going to give signal 2 um, to activate this T cell. Um, but if we treat with this CTLA-4-like molecule, it's going to compete for all the B7. Remember, CTLA-4 binds B7 more strongly. And now CD28 cannot um, be bound. We can't get signal 2, and we can't get those T cells turned on to start causing damage in our patient. And so again, we're still not hitting just the T cell, um, but we're getting things a little bit narrower. Um, the vast majority of the um, sort of biologic therapies that we have are cytokine-based therapies. This is a short list. Um, this is, I can't remember exactly what year this textbook uh, came out, but these are things that are coming out onto the market all the time. So this list, there's like no way your, test, or your textbook can actually be up to date because they come out so frequently, but this is some of them. And so what you can notice is we've got um, things that will act against individual cytokines like TNF or like interferon beta or interferon alpha or things like that um, that are often used particularly for rheumatoid arthritis um, or multiple sclerosis, though some of these TNF um, blockade uh, molecules have actually been used really broadly. Um, Ones that are not shown here include um, those that block IL-23 and IL-17. The IL-17 ones are kind of the, the hot ones in the field right now. Um, but there's sort of all of these things possible. And the way that these will work is like this. So usually TNF binds to the TNF receptor. Um, but we might have, say, an antibody that binds to TNF or you could even just use a fab, or you could use some kind of engineered molecule. But in either case, those are going to bind up the TNF, so the TNF can never hit the cell. And so we've stopped now the specific inflammatory response. Um, you can see sometimes we can also have um, antibodies that can block the receptor so that the cytokine can't get to the receptor. Um, so it could, we can have blockade of either the cytokine or the cytokine receptor. If you think about it, in the case of, say, TNF, well, when we've talked about an inflammatory response, we said an inflammatory response involves TNF, IL-1 beta, IL-6, you know, a bunch of cytokines. Now at least we're blocking only one of them, and if we want to have to deal with a pathogen, we've still got the rest of them worked out. So we're getting a little bit narrower. Um, these types of um, drugs have been, again, revolutionary for patients. So here um, you're actually seeing three different measures 
um, that are looked at in patients for rheumatoid arthritis. So first we have how much um, C-reactive protein. So that's sort of a measure of inflammation and you can see in our patients, you know, this, which is in the blue line, we've got a decent amount of C-reactive protein. We can see how many swollen joints our patient have and they've got a bunch of swollen joints. We can see how much pain they have. They have a bunch of pain. And then in the red, you can see a patient who was treated with an anti-TNF antibody over the first month, and you can see both the decreases in inflammation, swollen joints, and pain. And like I said, this drug has been just phenomenal for many patients with rheumatoid arthritis, with psoriasis, with Crohn's disease, with ulcerative colitis, and on and on and on. These drugs are working really well. Um, so many major pros to these. I can, I can go on and on. Um, but I also want us to remember one other thing about them. All right, I gotta figure out how to make this full screen. Is that one full screen? Oh, this one might full screen. No, wrong, stop. This one full screen? Nope, that's the same one I had before. How do I make it full screen? <clears throat> Top this one? Yeah. Oh. Hi, I'm Phil Mickelson. I've been fortunate to win on golf's biggest stages, but when joint pain and stiffness from psoriatic arthritis hit, even the smallest things became difficult. I finally understood what serious joint pain is like. I talked to my rheumatologist, and he prescribed Embril. Embril can help relieve pain, stiffness, and stop joint damage. Because Embril, Etanercept, suppresses your immune system, it may lower your ability to fight infections, serious, sometimes fatal events, including infections, tuberculosis, lymphoma, other cancers, and nervous system and blood disorders have occurred. Before starting Embril, your doctor should test you for tuberculosis and discuss whether you've been to a region where certain fungal infections are common. Don't start Embril if you have an infection like the flu. Tell your doctor if you're prone to infections, have cuts or sores, have had hepatitis B, have been treated for heart failure, or if while on Embril you experience persistent fever, bruising, bleeding, or paleness. Get back to the things that matter most. Ask your rheumatologist if Embril is right for you. Embril, the number one biologic medicine prescribed by rheumatologists. So that's one of the cytokine-based therapies that is listed here. And what I want you to notice about that ad is that at least half that ad were things that could go wrong, right? All the things, this could go wrong, this could go wrong, this could go wrong. So notice we've done a great job in terms of narrowing down and making our patient less immunosuppressed, and yet we still list all these complications and there are still there's still a fair amount of immunosuppression. So we do have a long way to go um, with a lot of these therapies. However, um, these therapies have been amazing in helping a lot of our autoimmune disease patients. Um, and we could also mention like dramatic costs and things like that, but that's a whole other um, issue. Um, so um, in total, um, we have figured out ways to deal with kind of our too much immunology or too much immune system problems um, pretty well. And largely that comes through um, our understanding and our ability to make small molecules that can hit signal one, signal two, or signal three. And so all of the pieces of signal transduction we've talked about, you know, we can hit calcineurin, we can hit cell cycle, we can hit the cytokine, we can hit the TCR, all of those pieces that we've talked about, because I mean, I'll just understand those things, we can come up with ways to start to address them. And so that's what I wanted to say about all of these therapies. Um, though you will see on Wednesday, I will be talking about some other therapy things that are going to sort of overlap or tie into some of this more. Um, today, I'm gonna, or now I'm going to switch gears into the stuff that was actually what I was planning to talk about today. Um, some of you who are taking Dr. Dunaway's class will sort of laugh as you see all of this because you're currently taking an entire class on the molecular biology of cancer, and I'm going to hit like four slides worth of the highlights of it and then just move into immunology pieces. Um, but there are a couple things that I want to make sure we're all on the same page with in our understanding of cancer before I get into cancer immunology. Um, 
so one of those uh, things that I want to um, briefly mention um, is sort of this idea of these ideas of transformation and mutation. Um, and um, there are lots of things that Dr. Donoy does that are awesome in Bio 250. But one thing that I think sometimes students come away from Bio 250 with, which I totally get why he does this, is that they get this idea of every single mutation you possibly get means you're going to die. Um, and you know, he, you sort of get this mutation equals cancer idea sometimes in your head. And so I want to make sure that we think specifically about what these terms mean. So mutations are just changes that happen in the DNA following exposure to a mutagen. That change in the DNA might change a protein. It might not. The change might be bad. It could be good. Maybe you become an X-Men. Um, maybe it's neutral. It could be anything. So the mutation is just the change in the DNA. If you get a mutation that impacts things like cell division or apoptosis, then you might not sort of have normal growth and death control of your cell. Every mutation doesn't impact growth or death control. Like some mutation in some one of my ancestors a long time ago gave me blue eyes. That has nothing to do with growth or death control. Some mutations can give you growth, changes in growth or death control. And in that case, the cell might be transformed because that cell might not be controlled by normal growth or death processes. So mutation can lead a cell to become transformed. Um, and you can see I've got that here. Transformation is going to uh, occur as a result of mutation or viral infection. However, they don't all, every mutation doesn't lead to transformation. It's only the ones that influence growth or death processes. So that, you know, we can't have, either if you have too many, too much growth or too little death, then we start to worry about this transformation issue. So know that every mutation is not really on the table here. We're really going to be thinking largely about mutations that are impacting growth or death processes. Um, and one thing that we know is that in order for a cell, in many cases, to um, become transformed, especially um, if it's going to be transformed and start to cause a problem in an organism. It turns out that there are a lot of these growth and death processes that I mentioned here are pretty redundant. It's rare that one mutation is going to mess up growth and death processes because we've got like backup plans and backups and backups and backups. And so typically, when we think about um, a cell actually sort of becoming a cell that's really um, sort of lost growth and death control, we tend to think about something called the multi-hit hypothesis, which is that we might have to have a cell pick up a number of mutations in different growth and death processes. We might need multiple hits. And so you can see here's one cell that picks up a first mutation. Maybe that cell proliferates a little faster. Then it might get a second mutation. Sometimes it might get a mutation in repair. And if it gets a mutation in repair, then it's probably going to not repair. So it's probably going to get more mutations easier. And so we often, in order to get a cell that's really kind of a total problem cell, are going to need to have many potential mutations, many hits um, on that cell. Um, and you could also imagine there might be kind of some neighboring cells that have had a few mutations but haven't gone all the way to that problem. Um, you can also note that each tumor, so here we've got tumor one, tumor two, and tumor three, might have those hits happen in a different order and might even have different hits. And so every tumor is basically unique in terms of exactly which mutations, which hits have it had to happen. There are certain pathways that are pretty commonly hit. 
but realistically, any tumor is going to be entirely unique from any other tumor. This is one reason why I always feel like the idea of like, you know, dealing with cancer is always very difficult to me because I'm like, every single person's tumor is completely unique. Um, so it's hard for me to think of something that cures all the cancers when there's such heterogeneity. Um, and you can see um, the multi-hit hypothesis um, here as well. You know, we might, we're going to have cells that might lose, um, that might get a mutation. Maybe we have a few cells that divide and have that one mutation. Then somebody gets a second mutation and on and on and on until we get to that tumor. The other thing that I want to mention really briefly is that sometimes people also get confused when they are thinking about transformation um, relative to something called oncogenesis. So if you go downstairs um, into the lab right now, I have some cells that I work on in my research that are transformed cells. So those cells are not controlled by normal growth and death processes. They basically will divide indefinitely. They're sort of immortal cells. That doesn't mean that if I take those cells and inject them into you, they will make a tumor. Sometimes people talk about them as cancer in a dish. And I, again, I know why they do that. But if I took them and put them into you, they would not actually cause a tumor. Um, and so the actual development of a tumor or the development of cancer in a person is this additional step after transformation. Transformation just means you can grow a long time in a dish. Oncogenesis actually means you can grow and make a tumor and cause problems in an animal. Um, classically, there are six hallmarks of cancer. Um, so there are six things that cells need to be able to do to cause uh, tumors. As we go through parts of this lecture, we're going to learn about a seventh one in addition to the six. Um, if you go through some of the most up-to-date literature on this, some people are up to like 12 or something I think now, um, really we're going to do six plus the one. Um, but what you will notice is that you know every cancer cell has to stimulate its own growth. Sometimes that might mean if it was, say, a T cell, maybe it would have to figure out a way to make its own IL-2 to give itself growth signals. That's what stimulate its own growth means. Um, those cells have to ignore growth inhibiting signals, avoid death by apoptosis. Um, they have to be able to reproduce constantly. They also have to be able to do things like develop a blood supply, um, which you know the cells in my dish downstairs don't have to do. And they have to be able to go from a site of origin to go to other tissues. Um, and so you can imagine that many changes have to happen to a cell in order to allow that cell to do all of these types of processes. So if you look at all these hallmarks, all of these things are things that you know, a cell probably needs to pick up some mutations for. They're all things that a cell probably might need to pick up multiple mutations, not just one. Um, so this is not like a thing that's just going to happen whoop, overnight. Um, you can see that there's a lot of stuff that's got to go on in this process. Um, and again, big picture, um, to just think about some causes of cancer, we've got a few different things that one could think about. Um, so we can think about a lot of different kind of environmental factors or lifestyle factors, you know, whether they're things like dietary, whether it's things like UV light, whether it's things like, you know, all that kind of, you know, toxin exposure, all those kind of things, um, as well as a number of different viruses that can lead to um, cancers and can lead to tumors. And so these are some of the big picture causes of cancer. So all of this is really interesting and fabulous. And you might look at me after looking at these slides and be like, Dr. Barker, do you remember what class we're in? We're in immunology. We're not in Dr. Donnelly's cancer class. 
Why the heck are you telling us this stuff? And so what we need to talk about on the next few slides is why immunologists care about cancer. And I will tell you that in kind of the next section of the slides, um, I am very impacted by kind of the time of when I went to grad school. Um, and so I think that I give this lecture in a very different way than some other immunologists might. Because when I went to grad school, there were some arguments about cancer immunology. I had professors that said cancer immunology didn't exist. Now if you look at your textbook, there's a cancer immunology chapter. And it's like, of course it exists. Like, what? And it's like, the idea that it wouldn't doesn't even come up. I'm going to sort of talk a little bit about that controversy and why some people were kind of like not so into it in the past. Because I think it does give us some interesting perspective and I want to show you the evidence that was used to kind of tell us, no, this really is a thing. Okay? So yeah, I know that if you read your textbook, like you won't find this and the textbook's like, yeah, of course it's a thing. Um, but I want us to think about why that hasn't always been what people thought about. You know, in, I have definitely taken immunology classes where we did not have a cancer immunology day. And we would say, you know, immunolo we wouldn't think about why immunologists care about any of this. So I want to make sure we think about why an immunologist cares. Um, well, one reason is sort of obvious and straightforward in that I just told you on the previous slide, there are some microbes that can cause cancers. And the immune system is going to help combat microbes. So we've got a number of different viruses um, that are shown here that can lead to some kind of cancer. The most famous, of course, would be HPV, um, human papillomavirus. Um, but there are another other, number of other types of viruses that can lead to tumors. And so you might say, well, if we figure out ways to change the immune responses to these viruses, we're going to impact cancer. That, that makes sense as a reason why cancer and immunology might go together. You might also say, well, I think the reason why immunologists might care about cancer is because when we treat cancer with radiation and chemo, we mess up the immune system. Remember that we talked about bone marrow transplantation as a major thing that has to happen in patients that have, that have had radiation and chemo because we actually wipe out the immune system and have to transplant hematopoietic cells. So immunologists probably should care a bit about cancer because um, bone marrow transplantation is going to be a big part of many cancer therapies and that is actually having to replace your immune system. So there's a way that the immune system and cancer are sort of tying in together. Um, and then the other reason why I think it's sort of obvious that immunologists can care about cancer is that we know that the immune system, we can have cancers of the immune system. So we can have all sorts of, say, errors in VDJ recombination that um, can make, say, B cells into different kinds of leukemias and lymphomas. So we can have cancer of the immune system. So in that way, there's a pretty obvious way that immunologists care about cancer. Um, and I would say that those are the, um, those are kind of the like very simplistic way that I would think about this. I'm, I'm looking at the order of the slides I have and trying to decide if I want to skip ahead or not. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and come back to these next few slides later because I, I just don't want to make that, I feel like that argument feels out of place to me. So I've shown you some ways or some reasons why immunologists care about cancer. And you can be like, yeah, 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 okay. But again, I want you to think back to when I was in grad school and those professors of mine who were like, yeah, there's no such thing as cancer immunology. They might, they, and they would say, yeah, okay, we, we get it that like we should care about leukemia and lymphoma and we should care about like viral cancers. But you know, like 
the lung cancer in a patient that gets lung cancer from smoking, like that's not an immunologist problem, is what that professor would have said. They, you know, the ones that come from some kind of all, all those other causes I showed you that weren't the viruses, those professors would be like, that is not a immunology problem. Or those cancers that come from, um, you know, you have some kind of mutation and end up with a breast cancer, that's not an immunology problem, is what that professor would have said. And there has been, there's sort of what became some increasing evidence, um, for those of you who are following along with the slides, I'm going to move ahead to 25 right now, um, that said that mm, maybe that's not true that those aren't immunology problems. So one of the things that was observed in so many different studies is that if you looked at a slide of a tumor, and in here you're seeing a, a breast cancer, and on the right you're seeing a um, skin cancer. If you look at the tumor cells, which are shown in red, which look like this, there are also all these other cells that sort of this nice dark purpley cell that are lymphocytes. In fact, pretty much any tumor that you look at is full of lymphocytes. And both of these are showing you like this huge thing of lymphocytes all in this skin tumor. Like this whole row is lymphocytes. This whole area is lymphocytes in this breast tumor. So you're like, well, there's lymphocytes there. And the lymphocytes are like going there. That, that, that makes me wonder whether this might be an immunology problem. If I've, we've got all these lymphocytes going there. We also find out um, that in sort of in the early 80s, when we started to see a lot of patients with AIDS who have a defect in their adaptive immune system, so they don't have a good CD4 immune system, they lose their adaptive immune response, a lot of AIDS patients get cancer all of a sudden. Um, and so Yes, AIDS patients will suffer from a bunch of different types of infectious diseases, but AIDS patients also start to suffer from a bunch of cancers. Some of them are, are um, you know, viral, but some of them are not, like this primary lymphoma of the brain. Like some of them are just, they start getting cancers. So it's like, well, if you get rid of the immune system, you get cancer, so that kind of makes us think that the immune system was doing something about the cancer in the first place. Um, and sort of around the same time, people were studying some immunodeficient mice, um, particularly uh, skid mice or nude mice. Nude mice have no thymus, so they have no T cells. Um, and because they have no T cells, their B cells can't get help. So B cells also don't work. Um, skid mice can be similar. Um, and if you just take your skid mice or take your nude mice and leave them on the shelf in your mouse facility, for a really long time and just let them get old, they get nasty tumors. Just super nasty tumors. And so there was more data that if your immune system's missing, you seem to get cancer. Which made people think, well, maybe your immune system is doing something about cancer. There were a couple of reasons why some of those professors that I had um, would argue about the immune system not being involved in cancer. Um, one of them I'm going to tell you about on the next slide because I, I sort of need the uh, pictures to show it. Um, but one of them is something we can just think about for a second. And again, I remember like one of my professors being like very in your face about this point. No way the immune system does anything about cancer. Absolutely not. He wouldn't hear nothing of it. What do you think was his number one reason why he thinks the immune system didn't do anything about cancer? 
Why did he need data like this and other data that I'll show you to convince him? Yeah, um, it's just a guess, but cancer is not necessarily a pathogen, so okay. it won't activate the innate immune system for PRR, which also would not activate T cells through PRRs. Okay, so we can think about, well, what is going on with innate immune signaling, right? We can't think, we're not necessarily sure about innate immune signaling going on here and getting things like PRRs and all of that to signal, particularly give us signal too. So abso that's absolutely part of it and absolutely right, but there's even kind of a simpler answer that he would give. And you're right, but that is totally right. Remember that we just finished recently talking about autoimmunity. What would his argument be? Cancer self. We just spent all this time talking about how we don't want any responses to self and how we make sure we don't have responses to self. And now we want to respond to self. And so there was a lot of talk, you know, it's been a lot of time being like, there is no such thing as cancer immunology because you can't just like have a response to self when you feel like it. Um, and I bring this up because I think that thinking about that perspective and thinking about the, wait, but what about self? And what about how this relates to autoimmunity and kind of what's going on with it, these antigens and how we deal with this is something that sometimes people like overlook. They'll come up with these like amazing cancer therapies and I'll be like, antigen? What is the antigen in this case? Um, and so one of the things I want us to think about in a bunch of these situations is what exactly is the antigen? How does it deal with that problem of self? And how do we get around or how do we interact with some of the self responses that we've been talking about previously? Um, one other kind of thing that um, was a little bit tricky and was sort of weird, like made for some weird arguments had to do with timing. Um, and so note that, you know, this image right here that's right in the middle is showing you the incidence rates of different cancers in um, different people of different ages. And so you can see cancers happening pretty late in life. And so there's sort of this question of like timing and like what's going on with the timing. And one other thing that we're going to think about is, you know, to the point where we get to, so if we have a tumor that's visible on an x-ray, for example, that tumor is 10 to the eighth cells, 100 million cells big. It started out as one cell that got those multiple hits. By the time it's actually going to be like a lump you can feel, it's a billion cells. So what you should also think about is the, the time between the first hit and a diagnosis, a patient's talking about any kind of problem, is going to be a really long time. And sort of, there were also some questions about this time situation and how that, whether that impacted or whether that was related to immunology at all. And that's something we'll come back to, um, but I just wanted to point, make sure we pointed that out because we are going to kind of be thinking particularly about this kind of timing thing of like, the beginning and the hit in the one cell. Maybe you had to get six hits for the cell to start actually dividing this quickly. So like, how many years is that between the first hit and then the second hit and then the third hit and then the fourth hit and then getting to the point of having 100 million cells? Like you can imagine that being a huge difference in time. And so we can kind of imagine differences in when we're thinking about like the 10 to the eighth cell cancer and the like one cell cancer. And we're gonna think a lot about kind of this one cell cancer. Like the, you can think about it as like a micro tumor or something like that compared to some of these later events. Um, yeah.
yeah, I'm just going to keep going this way because I think this makes more sense than doing those other slides. I got to figure out where those other slides are supposed to go. <laughs> um, and so there was this argument of, in terms of, is there such a thing as cancer immunology? Does the immune system do stuff for cancer? And one of the reasons that we sort of really started with some parts of this field is that you could take tumor cells from a mouse that were irradiated. So they were dead tumor cells. And you can inject them into a mouse. And they're dead tumor cells, and they don't give the mouse a tumor. So there's no little red bump. And then if you tried to give that mouse the same tumor, live versions, so viable cells, the mouse still doesn't get a tumor. It's like you can use a vaccine. It looks like an adaptive immune type of response to that tumor. So it's kind of like there's something going on with an adaptive response here because you can you pre-expose a mouse, then you can um, get some kind of response. And it's also specific. So if we inject a irradiated tumor and then try to give the mouse a different tumor, it's not like the mouse is like permanently cancer proofed. It can get other types of tumors, so it's a specific type of response. Um, this idea of kind of um, whether or not you can have memory and adaptive responses is part of the argument people were making with this timing question. Um, and we even have been able to show that if we take a tumor, and again, this is a mouse that we treated with a chemical carcinogen. So this isn't like a virus or something. This is like we got some mutations in that mouse. So no microbe or anything. We get that mouse. If we take some of that tumor off, and we see that, that we put it back into the original mouse, oh my gosh, the tumor doesn't grow. If we put that tumor into a different mouse, which is not shown here, it's rejected like it's a transplant. If we put it into a naive mouse, the tumor grows. If we just take our original mouse and take some CD8 T cells, give them to another mouse along with the tumor, CD8 T cells can protect. So again, it's like, oh my gosh, this is actually a T cell mediated thing that T cells can kill tumors. And there's a lot of data about things like this. Yep. So does that possibly have to do with the timing of when cancer starts to kind of skyrocket? Because towards the later years of our life, we stop producing T cells. Um, maybe a little bit, but that's not the biggest part of it. So we're, we're going there. We're going towards the, the biggest part of it. Um, we may, we'll see if we get there today or if we uh, get there to it on Wednesday. Um, and so one of the things I want to talk about before we get to that part is, okay, so I'm showing you T cells, and this is absolutely true, your textbook will tell you this, you can find this all the places, um, T cells respond pretty strongly to tumor cells. 100% yes. Why is that, why, what question should you have at this point? Why is there something that makes it feel like that doesn't tie in with the rest of the immunology? I'm like, yeah, T cells totally respond to tumor cells. Particularly like this mouse, you know, this mouse made T cells that can kill tumors. Note that the T cells didn't actually kill the tumors in the original mouse, but they can kill tumors in another mouse. Why is this weird? Yeah. How are they getting like all the signals they need to respond? Okay. So we have this like, how are they getting all the signals they need to respond? What's the what's the biggest signal they need to respond? For that. One. Signal one. <laughs> so first of all, it's like, what is the foreign antigen, right? So we need something that we need an antigen here. We also do need signal two, but we need an antigen. So what the heck is the antigen? Because it's a self cell. That cell came from that mouse, and so it's a self cell. And now we've got T cells responding against it. So what the heck are the antigens? This is something that people have been spending a lot of time thinking about. And what we think, we can generally think of three different kinds of antigens that tumors have. 
I'm going to tell you about them as three different kinds of antigens. I will also tell you that we put those three antigens into two groups. Because of how math works, that means one group has two kinds and the other group has one kind. Um, so we have one type that is known as a TSA. TSA stands for tumor specific antigen. And so the idea in a tumor-specific antigen is if I have some tumor, that antigen is specific to my tumor and only my tumor. It is tumor-specific. We also have some antigens that are known as TAAs. And TAA stands for tumor-associated antigen. Um, with a tumor-associated antigen, we, that one might not be as specific to tumors. It might be in some other things as well, but it's maybe frequent, more, more frequent in a tumor or something like that. So in a, so if we think about our TSA, our tumor-specific antigen, generally the things that are tumor-specific antigens are whatever the proteins are that are new proteins that came up after mutations. So remember, if we get a mutation in the DNA, that now encodes a different protein that has different amino acids. And so that, that when you have a different protein with different amino acids and you cut it up, it's different peptides on MHC. And so here you can see it was kind of burgundy, and then after mutations, it became red. Um, and so it's just whatever the mutation protein was um, that can now be a foreign antigen, unlike what the cell saw er earlier during development, unlike what the T cells were seeing during development. Um, one of the things that sometimes we will see in terms of a TAA, or tumor-associated antigen, is that we may see some protein get expressed at a really, really, really high level. So the cell might start making tons of some protein. The cell makes tons of that protein or overexpresses that protein. More of it is going to end up on MHC. And so maybe before you had a little bit of it to turn on T cells, and now you just have so much more. So see, before you, you had you made one little thing of it, and now you made six. <laughs> So there's lots more of it to go on in MHC. And so you could turn on T cells even stronger than you could before. Um, the third thing that can happen is that um, we know that there are, that all of our genes are really tightly regulated in terms of like when and where they're turned on. And there are some genes that are only turned on when you're an embryo in order to help you go through embryonic development. And then they're turned off for the rest of your life. And when cancer cells are, you know, mutating and replicating real fast and trying to avoid stuff, sometimes they get their regulation messed up and they start making fetal stuff that they weren't supposed to. And so the other kind of tumor-associated antigen would be inappropriately expressed um, embryonic or fetal genes. Um, and so these seem to be kind of the three big antigens that we see in tumor cells. Um, and so um, you can also see like sometimes the antigen is an antigen from a microbe, like a virus. If we have a viral tumor, you're like, okay, that's obvious why there's an antigen. Sometimes it's something that's overexpressed. And so there are some really famous proteins that are just overexpressed in certain cancers. Um, HER2 nu um, and MAGE are ones that people spend a lot of time looking at in a lot of cases. There are some that are really differentiation state um, specific. Um, here you can actually look at um, the, pro the process of um, making a fetal protein called alpha fetal protein. And in this study, they looked at patients who had um, cirrhosis and they said, well, they don't make it. Patients who had hepatitis, they don't make it. Patients who had cancers that were not liver cancers, they don't make it. Patients who have liver cancer, they all make this weird um, fetal protein. And again, you can see how many 
or how much of it is made, this is a different antigen, um, CEA, uh, carcinoid embryonic antigen. It's made in cancer patients, but it's not necessarily made in people who have other disease states. And so this can be an antigen that T cells could uh, recognize. And so one sort of question that we had to think about was, well, what the heck is going on with the antigen? I'm gonna go back to those slides I skipped. Um, I think I can tie them in right now. Um, we are learning more and more as well. The inflammation seems to be very much involved in uh, cancer processes. Um, and so normally what should happen in a bunch of cases is if we have some kind of PRR signal, that's usually because there was damage. And we're going to get you know, an immune response and cytokines. And one of the things that will happen is that we'll proliferate, we'll have some cells proliferate to fix the damage, right? Um, and so whenever we have inflammation, we end up having to have a little bit of proliferation and kind of tissue regeneration. It turns out that, we are, that when we see a lot of cancer cells, if there is excessive inflammatory cytokine, we might get excessive proliferation. And so one of the things that may lead us to some of this excessive proliferation is actually excess innate immune responses. Um, and so you could imagine, we talked a little bit about chronic inflammatory diseases and the fact that um, having kind of too much inflammation um, or certain types of other issues may lead your body to have just like excess inflammation. Well, if you have excess inflammation, that actually may um, be something that pushes you into extra proliferation and makes all of your cells proliferate too much and may help you on this tumor front. Um, and so it looks like actually excess inflammation and excess innate immunity can be a big driver here. And you might imagine that if you have excess inflammation from a variety of sources, that could start to lead to some of that signal to um, stuff that both Emma and Grace had talked about. One other thing that I will just mention, and part of this is because I like it, um, is we also are realizing that one of our big PRR groups recognizes DNA damage. And so you guys were asking, well, how do we get signal two? It may be that whenever the DNA breaks, that um, signals um, through uh, PRRs, and these are just some of the uh, papers looking at that. And so our cells may be starting to make a lot of signal too when they're getting DNA damage. Um, and so um, to address your questions about how we're getting the signal too and how we're getting the, in the inflammation, we're learning more and more about sort of this inflammation tie into cancer, and that's kind of a newer area. For a lot of what we've talked about in the past about cancer immunology, it was always, well, what's the antigen? What's the antigen? And a lot of what I'm going to point out as we move forward is going to very much be a what's the antigen kind of problem. But we should definitely remember that the inflammation piece, particularly chronic inflammation or the DNA damage, can be really key. Because of all that we've learned about cancer immunology, we've actually learned that there is a process that the immune system uses to deal with tumors and a way that tumors respond to that process. And so in fact, in order for us to have a tumor, the tumor has to have responded and gone through this sort of response to the immune process. We're gonna talk through the three steps of this on Wednesday, as well as some ways that we use the immune system to treat cancers, and then we'll move into vaccines. So it'll be a little mish, mat, mash, Again, um, between those two topics on Wednesday, and I will see you guys then. Remember, your assignment is due by 5.